This morning, I'm so excited that uh, Kathy Perch is going to be sharing. And, um, you know, it was minus 14, the wind chill factor this morning, and it snowed last night because I think otherwise this room would be wall to wall, standing room only, I'm sure of it. And, but I'm so uh, grateful for Kathy and we just wanted to pray for her. And if you don't know Kathy, real quickly introduce her to you. Kathy has at least three things going for her that I'm aware of. Okay, number one, she's married to the right Reverend um, uh, Perch, right, right here sitting down front, John Perch. Um, and John, you know, is our pastor of spiritual formation and community life. And uh, number two, oh yeah, Kathy does a lot of speaking uh, around with with Imago Christi and doing discovery retreats, and she she did that here in the fall with John for us, and that was wonderful. So uh, in my mind, I go, wow, that we got to get Kathy to to share more. And then number three, uh, this is another thing she's got going for her. She's a female. I I think I realized, yeah. And I used to have, you know, two female associate pastors. So we heard more of the female perspective. So that's really great. And then, of course, there's the bonus. And that just she's an amazing person, has a wonderful story. So I'm excited to hear from her. So I'm going to just pray for her. Father, I thank you so much for Kathy. And I thank you for her life and the story that you have written in her life, that you're still writing, and that is somehow already written because she's your masterpiece, your work. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to what you have to say to each of us through Kathy. And um, Lord, I pray this for Kathy, that you would open her heart to to what you have to say to her through her own uh, story. Uh, Lord, thank you that you are good and you delight in being good uh, through your children. So uh, we receive what you have to say to us, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Peter. You know, as Peter often prays before he gives a message from the word, help us to preach. And that is what I'm praying over myself today. And in a very real sense, I'm praying it over you. Help us to preach. Help us to preach is an imperative command, an action that we're encouraged to take from 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence. Eugene Peterson captured this verse by saying, through thick and thin, keep your heart at attention. In adoration before Christ, your maker, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you are living the way you are. And always with the utmost courtesy. Tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are. Tell them your love story with God. Preach to them with gentleness and courage by speaking about your life. Give your testimony regarding the faith that is within you. So what is your story of hope? What is my story of hope? I've asked Kara to come and read our scripture that we're going to be stepping into today. It's from Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening came, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. After dismissing the crowd, they took him along with him in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. A fierce gale of wind developed, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling with water. And yet Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. 
And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So on that day when evening came, Jesus said to them, let's go over to the other side. And after dismissing the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. If we pause now to review our lives, each of us have received that call to get into the boat. The call may have come in a very dramatic fashion, such as an audible word or an intense dream, or maybe a vision, like the characters of the Bible, Samuel, Isaiah, or Joseph experienced. But maybe God called you in quieter ways. Maybe God called you through experiencing the wonder of nature and his creation. Or maybe he used music. When I was a teenager, I remember listening to Jesus Christ Superstar in our basement with my seven siblings. <laughs> we rocked out to all those tunes. And we really joined the disciples as they sang, What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. There was a call and they didn't quite understand it yet. Maybe the call was voiced through teachers or coaches or friends. I had never read the Bible for myself until in high school, some friends shared with me a verse that really um, was written on my heart forever. That verse was Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That was the first verse I memorized, and it held a strong place of hope in my soul. Maybe there were difficult circumstances which drew you to the Lord, and it led you to this place to crying out to the Lord as your refuge and your hope. Or maybe you had a mom or a dad, a grandma or grandpa, and they spoke of God in ways that stirred your heart to hope in a God who loved you. Well, some of us may have heard that invitation to hope, but we found ourselves just observing Jesus getting into the boat while we lingered on the shoreline. We were hesitant to believe what God offered to us. Come away with me. Let's go over to the other side. Looking around, we saw the temporal fading things that were scattered along the shoreline. And then, maybe with some uncertainty, maybe with a great deal of uncertainty, we got into that boat with Jesus. Well, I got a call to come into the boat early in my life. I love this Jesus who called me, but I really wasn't too sure about getting it, what getting into the boat with him would mean. Now, as I picture myself as that young person in the boat, I see Jesus opposite, opposite from me, and I'm sitting on this end. I will sit here quietly. I will do as I'm told. I won't rock the boat. However, as I got older, I, I did rock the boat. I turned my face from him to look back onto the shore. And then the boat, it began to list. Those things which I saw left behind were calling to me, whispering, look at what you're leaving behind. You need these things. You don't know where this Jesus is taking you. You don't know what's on the other side. These things on the shore, this is what you know. Though I didn't leave the boat, I allowed my heart to wander away. I pursued love in all the wrong places. I experimented with things which the world told me I needed to be free to experience happiness. And looking back, it was like I had cast a fishing line back to the shore to snag those things I thought I was missing out on as I sailed away. As I sailed away, even now, I recognize that I was seeing myself as the only one in that boat. 
I can see more clearly what was happening. And the, the listing of the boat intensified, and in nautical terms, the listing is described as the off-center distribution of weight. I was straining and grasping, and the weight distribution was off-centered, and I was in this place of being off-centered and out of balance. And what did I find Jesus doing? Throwing me overboard to right the boat? No. Jesus wrapped his arms around me, and he pulled me close to himself. And I turned towards him, and he helped me put down the line that I thought I had to have by showing me that they were empty promises of hope and fulfillment. And together, we put down the line. The boat settled, and we journeyed on. Because faith in love is hope. As we travel through the decades of my 20s and 30s and 40s, with Jesus, this journey held times of great joy. I married my high school sweetheart, and God blessed us with three wonderful children whose hearts were open to knowing and loving God. My husband Lynn and I served in our church together for many years. Lynn was an elder and the music leader, I taught Sunday school, became an Awanas instructor, helped to facilitate VBS, worked in the women's ministries. We were committed to following the Lord, and we wanted to be part of building up the kingdom. However, I did experience times of instability. But these times were not due to clinging to the false hopes of the past. Together, Jesus Jesus and I weathered some difficult storms, There were waves which washed over the boat again and again. Two sorrowful miscarriages, a couple of heartbreaking church splits, my sister's painful divorce, serious illness in the family, and the death of my father. But the Lord sat beside us as a faithful friend, and we leaned into his strength because faith in love is hope. One of our toughest days when the sky seemed to grow so dark and the thunder rolled occurred as my daughter was in high school. The spring day in 1999 started out sunny and bright, but before noon on that day, our whole world would be turned upside down. The tragedy of a deadly school shooting opened up a floodgate of pain and sorrow. Our oldest daughter was trapped in the school for four hours while we waited for her at the nearby elementary school. She finally arrived at the school on the last bus, which picked up students whom the SWAT team had found and led to safety. Quite a few months later, I reflected on this time of waiting. As we stood in the gym, I would see her friends coming through the door, and I would question them to see if they had seen her. We waited, and we waited. As parents were reunited with their kids, I looked around. The number of those of us who waited became smaller and smaller. Finally, Lynn and I saw her coming through the gym doors, and we were able to hug our daughter and help her get home. But I had stood with those parents of those children who would never walk through those doors. There was such pain and sorrow. How could a good God allow this to happen? It felt like a storm cloud constantly overshadowed us. There's a song by Casting Crowns, Praise You in This Storm, which seemed to sum up the way we were feeling through those years, through those early times. But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain, I am with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands, 
for you are who you are, no matter where I am. And every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. You never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. God never left our side. I could feel him weeping with us as the whole world seemed to weep. We would see God redeem the situation in many ways over the years. Our daughter was able to share her testimony with over 500 students in North Carolina. These are the words that I wrote in my journal then. She challenged believers to share the hope that they have with others. Later, we heard that over 25 people had expressed a desire to know Christ. One man wrote to her, telling her how what she said made him rethink his life. One of the students, who had been shot three times, had a long road of recovery. But he started on that road of recovery with forgiveness. I have edited some of his words to preserve his privacy. There was a time when I saw my mom, and she was really upset. And I said to her, what's wrong? What's going on? I'm just really angry that this would happen to you, his mother replied. Why? Why would this happen to you, to our community? community? I'm angry at those who did this. The young man remembers I said something to the effect of, please forgive them. Why? Why should I ever forgive them? She asked. Because they were confused. They didn't know what they were doing, he responded. It was a turning point for the family. The young man stated, from that time on, we were able to heal. Let's hear his words again. They didn't know what they were doing. Those words sound familiar somehow, don't they? And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. In our grief, we recognized Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was Emmanuel, God with us in our sorrow. We chose to put a condensed version of Romans 8, 31 through 39 on a brick, which has been placed with other stones lining the school's softball fields. It reads, Nothing can separate us from his love. We held on to love, to hope, because faith in love is hope. Little did I know that only seven years later, that belief that nothing can separate us from his love would be greatly tested. And a fierce gale of wind developed and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling with water. And yet Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? It was another spring day, this time in 2006. The school year was drawing to a close and our family was looking forward to the summer. We had planned a family trip to Costa Rica. But on this warm day, a fierce gale was rising, and soon the children and I would be caught up in a swirling cloud of sorrow. Lynn headed to work that day, faithful to deposit a kiss and a message, I love you. I love you too, I re responded. It's going to be 82 degrees today, so take it easy. I will, he promised. Lynn had signed up to run a charity race at work to raise funds for the children's Christmas project. He left the house with a warm smile, and I headed off to teach my fifth graders at our nearby elementary school. 
Around 2.30 that afternoon, the principal walked down to my classroom and waved me into the hallway as she ushered the librarian in to take my place. We walked to her office, and I was met by a policeman and the coroner. I dropped into a chair, and they began to recount the morning events. As Lynn ran the race, he had suffered a major heart attack. Though the Flight for Life helicopter had been summoned, Lynn was gone instantly. Our children arrived at the school, and I could barely get the words out to tell them that Lynn had died. Wave after wave of grief crashed over us. It felt as though I would drown in this crushing sorrow. The only relief I had was to go to the graveside and look up into the sky, and among the clouds, I would picture Jesus there and Lynn standing next to him, each with an arm around the other. Summer was rough. I moved through the days in a zombie-like state, and the nights were filled with dreams of Lynn as I imagined that he was still with us. Already a close family, this shared loss drew us even closer. But the summer turned into fall, and the kids headed off to college and work, and I was left alone in the house. I remember so visi- <laughs> I remember so vividly sitting on the sofa in the family room and crying out to the Lord. It was more of a groan that originated deep in my gut, the sound of a wounded animal. But it was so strange that at this time of overwhelming despair, it felt like my prayers just hit the ceiling. My pain was so great that I really couldn't even sense the Lord's presence with me. This is too much. I can't do it. I can't go on. I can't feel you here with me. Are you asleep? Don't you care? And yet Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushions, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? The silence in the house was deafening. Sometimes I I couldn't sleep in our bed, and I would wander downstairs to spend a restless night in the couch. I felt so confused and angry with God. We had made plans to go to the mission field when we were empty nesters. Wouldn't that have been a good plan? My tears from this great loss soaked my bed. I told God that I didn't want to be around anymore. It was just too painful. I wasn't thinking straight. I told him the kids would be okay. I just wanted to go home and be with God. The night I spoke those words, an intense pain came into my side. It was like God's finger was poking me just below the ribs. I was scared and I began looking around for my phone to dial 911. But just as quickly as the pain had come, it subsided. So it seemed like I wanted to stay around for a while. When I struggled to put one foot in front of the other, God brought two women into my life to give me the support I needed. These women came alongside me to walk with me in this great time of deep need. And we literally walked. One of them would meet me on Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. And we wore a path through the neighborhood. She did most of the talking words of love and understanding. The other dear friend would meet me on Thursday evenings. Her communion with the Lord had always been so sweet, so deep, that it had prepared her to be the companion that I needed. One of the things she shared with me was the story of Hagar. Hagar was the Egyptian maidservant of Sarah, When Hagar became pregnant with Abraham's child, there arose bad feelings between the two women. Hagar fled to the desert, and in her despair, the angel of the Lord appeared to her and met her in her pain. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, Adonai Elroy. You are the God who sees me. My dear friend was able to minister to me about the truth. He sees me. 
I clung to those words. A deeper kind of faith began to rise up in me. Though God had seemed so silent in the dark times when I felt like I needed him the most, he was at work. Philip Yancey, in his book, Disappointment with God, writes, The kind of faith God values to develop best when everything fuzzes over, when God stays silent, when the fog rolls in. I realized that I had placed my confidence in God because of the blessings of the gifts I expected to receive from his hand. And now I was learning to love God as the gift giver because faith in love is hope. And they got, and he, and he got up and rebuked the winds and said, hush, be still. And the winds died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? It became perfectly calm. A great calm occurred in my soul. I so desperately needed to know that God saw my pain. My circumstances on the outside remained the same, but God was at work within me. He was quieting my soul with his holy hush. Zephaniah 3.17 says this, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. Because faith in love is hope. As I examined the journey of that first year of loss, I remembered something very important. I recognized more clearly what God was about doing in retrospect. In the fall before Lynn's passing, it was my rhythm in the evenings to walk on my treadmill, taking time for some much-needed exercise for mind, body, and soul. I had Romans 12 propped up on the front of the ledge of the machine. I was trying to memorize the passage, and as I was working through it, God brought something to mind that I had been considering for a few weeks. I recognized a multifaceted situation we had at our Englewood Church. It seemed to come together around Wednesday night offerings. We had Awanas for the preschoolers and the elementary kids, and it was a well-attended program because we were busing kids in from a poorer neighborhood. We had Bible study for the adults, but it seemed to be lacking good attendance. And we had the occasional homeless individual or family who would come to the church for help. My idea was to feed these poor children and their parents if they attended and the older folks in our church family, and the homeless who would stop by. I would offer them a warm dinner on Wednesday night before the other activities started. I had taken this idea to the elder board, but they were hesitant to give me the green light. As I exercised and thought through the situation, I distinctly heard God say to me, I'm going to ask you to do something hard. I immediately reviewed the struggles of making this Wednesday night dinner happen, and I told God that I was willing to take on this hard work. It wasn't until after Lynn's death that I realized God was actually speaking to me about the loss of Lynn. But after spending a couple of years in the healing process, I recognized I was still so fearful. Something terrible had happened, and I felt so vulnerable. I had panic attacks and a loss of feelings of loss of control. It was then that I realized I didn't trust God. I knew the hard things that God was asking me to do on the treadmill was actually to trust him. Could I trust God with my life and with the life of those around me in the middle of a storm? I murmured, I'm afraid. I believe Help my unbelief. It's time to trust God and get out of the boat. In 2007, Paul Young published the book, The Shack. 
The book moved me so deeply that I bought 20 copies of it that year to give away. It's a powerful story of disappointment with God. Mackenzie, the main character, experiences the violent death of his loss of his daughter. He is stuck in what the family calls the great sadness. Angry and confused, Mac confronts God with desperate questions. God meets him in unexpected ways. This is one of my favorite scenes captured here. It's Jesus' invitation to Mac. Jesus had walked on the water across the pond to Mac standing next to him in the boat. Now let's get you out of the boat. What? You heard me. This is, that is not funny. I'm not joking. You can do this. I can't. Not on your own, you can't. I'll sink. No, Mac. You're imagining a future without me. And that future does not exist. I promised to go with you always, right? And I'm right here. Come on. Another quote from Philip Yancey. When the world asks if there is any hope, we can say absolutely. No one is exempt from tragedy or disappointment. God himself is, was not exempt. Jesus offered no immunity, no way out of the unfairness, but rather a way through it to the other side. And we have to grab onto his hand and go through the pain with Jesus as we respond to his invitation to come with him to the other side. Because faith in love is hope. Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Do you still have no faith? In this place of the disciples continuing to be very much afraid, we notice a question beginning to surface. Who is this man? The disciples had seen so many miracles of healing, but perhaps in the tumult of this storm, when their need to be saved was so personal, they turned to Jesus. We are perishing. I am perishing. And this experience drove them to him opened their hearts to know him, to really know him and the power of his presence with them. Who is this man? He's Emmanuel, God with us, seen or unseen, felt or unfelt. God remains. This God with us is love, And this God of love breathes his love, his faith into us so that we have the faith of Christ. His faith into us and God remains and he is with us in our pain and our grief and he speaks to our hearts. Hush, be still, receive my rest. God does not promise us that we will not experience the storms, but instead that he will be with us in the storm. There is no future that we can imagine without him. When the dark storms gather and our faith fails, when faith gives way to doubt and love to fear, the faith of Christ upholds us because faith in love is hope. The Call of the Disciples by Malcolm Geit. He takes the scripture passage that we just heard and he puts it into these beautiful words. He calls us all to step aboard his ship, 
take the adventure on this morning's wing, raise sail with him, launch out into the deep. Whatever storms or floods are threatening, if faith gives way to doubt or love to fear, then, as on Galilee, we'll rouse the Lord, for he is always with us and will hear and make our peace with his creative word who made us, loved us, formed us, and has set all his beloved lovers in an ark. Born upward by his spirit, we will float above the rising waves, the falling dark. As fellow pilgrims driven toward that haven where all will be redeemed, fulfilled, forgiven. Who is this man who called us, who made us, who redeemed us? Well, he's a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and he gave thanks. And he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. Remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so now we invite you to come and take part of him. You are way make miracle work promise keep light in the darkness my God that is who you are that is who you are that is who you are that is who you us to believe that, that that is who you are. When the storms come and the thunder rolls, Lord, help us to believe that you are a way maker. And you love us. Amen. So who is this man? Well, he is the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. I started this message with a prayer. Help us to preach. Tell your story of hope. Proclaim the good news of this God with us in all things. Let go and press into the faith of Christ within you. I bless you, my brothers and my sisters, that through the faith of Jesus, you will find the strength and courage and gentleness to give an account of the hope that is in within you. Because Faith in love is hope. Amen.